Hi, everyone. I'm pleased you've joined us today for this online UC Santa Cruz laser talk. I'm Rachel Nelson, Director of the Institute of the Arts and Sciences. LASER stands for Leonardo Art and Science Evening Rendezvous and is an international program bringing together artists, scientists, and scholars for presentations and conversations. For those of you who are familiar with our LASER talks, you know that these short presentations offer compelling introductions to the work of UC Santa Cruz faculty and other artists and researchers. The talks are a unique opportunity for people on campus to learn about what their colleagues are researching and creating, and lasers are also how we share this work with our larger community. Today, we're particularly glad to have partnered with the Humanities Institute and the Center for Teaching and Learning to feature three speakers, public philosophy scholar Kyle Robertson, Buddhist scholar Paula Arai, and astrophysicist Ruth Murray Clay. This should be a fantastic and fascinating array of talks, which will neatly illustrate what's so interesting and important about laser events. Even in these dark and conflicted times, the diversity of approaches and topics that we'll delve into today will give a glimpse into the range and diversity of knowledge production that defines higher education at its most dynamic, and which is only ever more important in understanding the world around us. So let's get this underway. While it'd be a pleasure for me to talk in depth about all of our speakers and their accomplishments, I know you'd much rather hear from them. Therefore, I'll introduce each of our speakers only briefly before giving them their screen. Another logistical note, we'll hold all questions until after the presentations. I encourage you, however, to ask your questions as you think of them by entering them into the Q&A. We'll get to as many as possible in the latter part of the program. Now for our first speaker. I'm pleased to welcome Kyle Robertson. And Kyle, you can join me. Kyle's a lawyer and a lecturer at the UC Santa Cruz Philosophy and Legal Studies Departments. In 2015, he co-founded the Center for Public Philosophy at our university to great um, interest and in, uh, I would say participation. He's involved with high school ethics bowls, teaching as he teaches as part of the Mount Tumultuous College in San Quentin State Prison. And he also is involved in philosophy for children. He regularly speaks on public philosophy and publishes on the challenges of doing it. Thank you so much for being here, Kyle. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you for that. Welcome, Rachel. Um, uh, let me share my screen. Let's see. All right. So I think that I'm properly sharing my screen. I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm excited. My only regret, I suppose, is that we're not in person because um, I, you know, as many, I think, faculty here, I'm a little sick of talking to my screen uh, for Zoom classes. I'm going to do my best. So you'll also hear my dogs in the background. Apologies in advance. Um, I want to talk about a couple of different things about the Center for Public Philosophy. Um, there's our little graphic. Um, public philosophy is something that uh, has a lot of different meanings, and I'm going to try and talk to you about two of them tonight. Uh, one of them is sort of embodied in speaking to you now, right? So philosophers and public scholars in general uh, talking about their research in a way that's accessible to the public and not just other academics. And so I'm going to talk about an idea in modern philosophy um, that motivates part of my work, the concept of epistemic oppression. But I'm also going to talk about um, some of the work I do at the center that I, I'm honestly more passionate about, which is public philosophy as philosophical dialogue and activity with different people outside of the standard university community. So I'm going to talk in particular today about a program uh, in San Quentin State Prison, you can see on the top there, a debate program that I helped to start and run, and programs in local Santa Cruz City schools where we do philosophical dialogue with children. And my goal today is to talk to you a little bit about how I see these two programs as addressing somewhat similar issues and uh, to justify why we would do philosophy in these sorts of places. So the concept I wanna to talk to you about a little bit, uh, the philosophical background is the notion of epistemic oppression. Um, so a lot of folks in epistemology and ethics have been talking about this lately. Again, I apologize, the dogs are welcoming my father in who's taking care of my children. Um, so Dotson defines epistemic oppression as the persistent epistemic exclusion that hinders somebody's contribution to knowledge production. Um, it's, a, it's a type of oppression that tends to exist when, or maybe always exist when there's other forms of oppression too, such as social oppression, legal oppression, social and economic oppression. Um, and the reason I wanna introduce this term though, is I think when we're talking about doing public philosophy, um, 
I, I'm sorry, the dogs are gonna distract us all. Um, I wanna be, be clear about what sorts of things public philosophy might be able to do. And I think epistemic oppression is a really good term for the kinds of uh, work that the, the public philosophy I'm talking about might do. Um, but I wanna give you a few examples. So part of explaining epistemic oppression is I wanna give you some examples, not from my work, about what it might mean. So philosophers like Dotson talk about uh, testimonial injustice as an example of epistemic oppression. So this is a case where um, there's a shared epistemic language where we talk about expressions and establishing facts, but a certain group of people or person, their expressions are given less weight than they should, and they're given less weight than they should for unjust reasons. So I picked this slide because I assume you might recognize, or many of you might recognize, this is a shot from the movie version of To Kill a Mockingbird. If you know this story, a central part of the story is a court case where an all white jury discounts the testimony of black witnesses. Right? And this is a form of testimonial injustice and epistemic oppression where a certain community, uh, the black Americans are denied the right to participate in our epistemic practices. Right? The court of law functions as a sort of epistemic um, system in our culture. It establishes the facts about what happens in a particular case. And we have testimonial injustice when we don't equally participate and we're not given equal weight in this context. Another kind of epistemic oppression, maybe a sort of second order, as Dotson calls it, uh, they label hermeneutical injustice. And so an example here is a case where there is a common shared experience, but there's no longer common shared language. So in a testimonial injustice, in the prior slide, um, everybody's using the same language, but the certain qualities of the speaker are making people unjustly discount their contribution. For hermeneutical injustice, the idea is that a certain group doesn't even have language to express their experience, to participate in epistemic activity. And a common example here is the legal history of the idea of marital rape. Um, so in many contexts, historical and sadly uh, places in the world today, the concept of marital rape in the law is seen as a contradiction in terms. And the reason is that rape is defined as something, a crime you can only commit against someone other than your spouse. And a scholar who develops this in detail, I love Carol Pateman's work and it's a big part of her book, The Sexual Contract, if you're interested in these arguments. So the idea here is it's a hermeneutical injustice when married women cannot express their experiences of violent assault. They're literally denied the language to talk about their experience and thereby participate in public epistemic practices that establish the truth of what happened in a particular situation. Now, I, I think you'll find it, or I expect you will, will be on board with me when I say that epistemic oppression is a part of being in prisons. Um, but I also wanna convince you that it's a part of being a child in our society. Um, although in 20 minutes, I don't know if I'll be able to do a full job of that. But I'll give you a few examples, right? So in prison, epistemic oppression happens all the time. So for example, in, in an example that happens to many incarcerated people, when there's an incident inside the prison, something that might lead to a write-up or a disciplinary action, incarcerated people are regularly excluded from any sort of inquiry that establishes the facts of what happened, if there even is a formal inquiry. Right, the word of the corrections officer, the CO is taken as truth and the incarcerated person isn't able to participate in the process of establishing truth when the outcome of that process is punishing them. Right, So the person who's being punished doesn't even get to participate. And that's a clear form of epistemic oppression. But it, in a completely different context, so with children and when children are thinking about philosophical questions, I also think there's a form of epistemic exclusion that can be oppressive. Right, so children's genuine philosophical expressions are often dismissed as cute or naive rather than serious. Right? They're often, uh, so when we talk about kids, for example, about fairness or justice, um, when they say something that doesn't match our notion of what fairness and justice mean, they're often dismissed or corrected as opposed to be, being taken as genuine agents right? and genuine agents capable of having an epistemic point of view. So I wanna talk about, that's the, that's the sort of philosophical background. I wanna talk about how I think the programs that the Center for Public Philosophy is running might be trying to address or undermine or challenge some of this epistemic oppression. 
So inside San Quentin, um, we've started a program called the Ethics Bowl. Now we do Ethics Bowls all over. There's a, there's a UCSC college Ethics Bowl team. We do middle school Ethics Bowls and high school Ethics Bowls. Um, but inside San Quentin, we work with this organization, Mount Tamil Pius College. It's a fully functioning, actually recently accredited junior college inside San Quentin State Prison. And so they have student body and they now have a debate team. This is pictures of the last three debate teams that we've had. Now, Ethics Bowl is a debate format that is different from forensic debate in a variety of ways. And I wanna give you a little flavor of it so you have a sense of what we're doing. Um, this is a little bit of a wall of text, but I brought it from an article that a uh, book chapter that's coming out this summer where I'm talking about Ethics Bowl and I'll try and summarize it for you here. Um, the type of debate you may be used to is called forensic debate. It's called forensic because it's based on arguments in a court of law. Um, and it's based on arguments that are sort of zero sum where you have a client and you tend to win or lose. Um, Ethics Bowl is an attempt to reimagine what debate would look like if it was modeled on a philosophical dialogue as opposed to a sort of rhetorical competition in a courtroom. And so it's different in a number of ways. So for example, it's collaborative. The parties, including on the team, but also between the two teams, work together over the course of a round to try and come to a better answer, right? And so um, for, a concrete example is that the teams are not assigned a position. In forensic debate, oftentimes a coin flip is the beginning of a round. And the coin flip determines what you're actually going to argue. In ethics bowl, that's never the case, right? Teams are always arguing what they think and they are always working with each other to pursue a better answer. So for example, both teams might agree on a particular case. And then their goal is to have a good philosophical conversation about that case. The other big difference between ethics bowl and forensic debate is that participants are explicitly incentivized to be open-minded and they're rewarded for being open-minded. That happens in a couple of ways. So first of all, in their presentation, they are supposed to talk about the best reasons why they might be wrong. So they're not just presenting their own view, they're also trying to present the view of real people who would disagree with them. But then a second concrete factor is that over the course of a round, over the course of a conversation, teams can actually be rewarded for thoughtfully changing their mind, right? If Ethics Bowl is doing what it's supposed to do and there's a good conversation between the teams and the judges, um, it might be the case that the teams uh, think about an argument in a new way and actually shift their position on a case. This would constitute just losing a round in forensic debate, but it's embraced in Ethics Bowl. So how might this sort of program undermine epistemic depression inside of San Quentin State Prison? Well, I think there's a variety of ways this could work and I'm just gonna to point to a couple. Um, the first thing that I think uh, happens a lot of times or is underlying epistemic oppression is that when we deny certain people the ability to participate in knowledge creation, there's a sort of flip side where others are given maybe too much power, too much ability to participate in knowledge creation. So certain people, certain roles in our society are given a lot of apparent authority when we're talking about issues of ethics or politics, which is what all the ethics bowl cases cover. So what we do in an ethics bowl is we bring in people with that sort of status to be judges. This is a picture of the judging panel from the first round we held inside San Quentin. And these folks are, I'll give you very brief descriptions of them. On the left uh, is a gentleman who's a community activist and pillar in Oakland, California, a community where many of the incarcerated men who are on the team are from. In the middle is a retired philosophy professor from Chicago, a man who actually invented the ethics bowl format in the 90s, who flew out for this event. And on the right side is a UCSC product, uh, Dr. Sandra Dreisbach, who got her PhD here, and is one of the first people to bring ethics bowl to our campus. So we have three authorities on applied ethics and political questions, and they come as judges and their entire role is not to say anything about what they think. Their entire role is to listen to what the teams are presenting. And so this can serve as a sort of hack or mess with the epistemic dynamics that are going on inside the prison, right? If you look at the judges and you listen to them and they're only paying attention to what the incarcerated students are saying, you're sort of forced to pay attention also. We can use sort of, uh, well, yeah, I'm gonna keep going. Um, the second thing, uh, the programmatic choice we make with the ethics bowl that I think might undermine epistemic oppression is we make it into a community event. So this is the camera basically going the other way at the same event. Uh, this is the audience that was there for our first bowl. And hopefully you can see 
there's quite a few incarcerated students here, all the folks in blue, right? They're wearing their official state issued uniforms. Um, but there's also a lot of outside folks who came in to observe this event. A lot of times, one of the things that can cause epistemic oppression is just isolation, a sort of epistemic isolation, right? The men inside San Quentin have very limited ability to participate in conversations and get their views out because they are constrained. They can't move and they can't even really communicate with the outside world except in ways that are approved by the correctional officers and the warden. And so an event like this where we bring the communities together, I think can start to undermine some of the epi epistemic norms at work. Um, the quote I put on the left here, I uh, you know Rachel referenced world events. Um, this is something that a friend of mine, a, a public philosopher posted on Facebook this week that really resonated with me and part of why I do this work, even though he was talking about an announcement of doing philosophy uh, about the Ukraine, a public event talking about the philosophical contributions of the Ukraine. And Ian said, an attack on a person's body is also generally an attack on their dignity. Listening and responding to what they have to say about philosophy is a small way of helping restore that dignity. And I thought it was a great encapsulation of what I'm trying to say about what's going on inside San Quentin here. All right. I'm going to completely shift gears in the last five minutes or so, um, because I think there's a link between the kinds of work I'm doing in San Quentin and the kinds of work we're doing with children in Santa Cruz. I want to be clear, I don't think there's anything like the oppression that happens at a prison going on with young children. But I think there is some form of oppression going on. And I think that engaging with children on philosophy can have similar sorts of effects. Um, and I referenced this earlier, I think the sort of epistemic exclusion that children face is, there's many versions of it, but one is that their genuine philosophical questions are often taken in a way that's not serious. Um, and so in my experience talking to kids, right, they have a lot of thoughts and ideas about things like justice and fairness and things like racism, and they wanna talk about them, but they're often denied a place and their language is often controlled, right? They're often uh, taught that there's a certain way to talk about these things, and that way might be secret or unclear to them, or they'll learn it when they're older. And so we've one of the motivations of philosophy for children is to give them a space and to give them tools to have these conversations with each other. So a concrete example of the kind of thing we do, um, and I, I have to, as I thanked Mount Tamil Pius College, um, talking about working in San Quentin, to thank a whole bunch of groups that have helped to teach me how to work with children in this way. And particularly the University of Hawaii at Manoa has a center for philosophy and ethics and education that was kind enough to train me in some of this stuff. And this is one of the tools they use. So when you teach children how to have a philosophical conversation with each other, you have to do a fair amount of work of teaching them how to ask each other questions and how to give reasons and arguments for what they think. And so we use this tool here called the Good Thinkers Toolkit at schools in Santa Cruz. And this actually constitutes a fair amount of what we do over the course of a school year. We work with them on speaking to each other and taking the teacher out of the authority position, right? The students are very used to giving answers and then looking at the teacher or the adult in the room to see if that's the right answer and getting a sort of thumbs up or thumbs down and moving on. The Good Thinkers Toolkit and a lot of the philosophy for children methodology is intended to teach them to look to each other to not have a sort of outside standard about what is a good philosophical question or a good philosophical answer, but teach them to engage in this sort of conversation together. All right, <clears throat> that's the basics of what I wanted to say. And I, I'd be happy to talk about any aspect of these programs. I wanted to, to end with a sort of something I was thinking about as I was, I was preparing this, I call the ambivalence of surprise. When I talk about these programs, and when I invite people to participate in these programs, one of the overwhelmingly most common reaction is surprise. It's often a joyful surprise, but it's surprise, right? Surprise that people who look like the people in these pictures would have such insightful, thoughtful things to say about ethics and politics. So on the left, I, I haven't talked about this program on the left yet, but that's a group of women from uh, Watsonville High School. Um, one of the ethics bowls that we host on campus is called the Outreach Invitational, and it's a program that serves community members on the Central Coast that often don't have access to these sorts of debate programs. 
So to, in, to serve this community, we do it bilingually in Spanish and English. And this is a team uh, on UCSC campus from one of our events. And then on the right, of course, that's one of the San Quentin teams, along with my amazing co-coach, Kathy Richards, who's been helping me run this program for quite a while. So this, this common reaction is surprise, sort of like, oh my gosh, that was such an amazing experience. I can't believe how insightful they were. And if that surprise is sort of, it's like a genuine recognition of humanity and dignity in a place you didn't think it was gonna exist. I understand that, I kind of appreciate that. But it also often makes me sad, right? So one of the points of these programs in my, in my view is to try to create conditions where you won't be surprised that uh, deep insights about politics and ethics and the like come from people who look like this and are in places like this, right? So maybe one of the success criteria I could have for this program is that people who come observe come with high expectations, right? With expectations that folks who look like this will have amazing things to say, right? And ought to be regularly participating in our knowledge construction. So thank you so much for listening. Um, be excited to talk about any aspect of this program and here, here's my email and my web address for the Center for Public Philosophy. Thank you so much, Kyle. And you know, I was about to say that everybody who has questions, if you'll put them in the Q&A, we'll get some at the end, but there actually is a question that you could just answer rather quickly, which is an example of a topic discussed in the San Quentin Ethics Polls. Oh, sure. So I, I showed you a bunch of pictures from that round and the case that the San Quentin team argued was about um, whether and how psychiatrists should render opinions on the mental fitness of political candidates. This was obviously relevant in Trump, right? It was the so-called Goldwater rule. Uh, and it was actually, it was an amazing case to hear because the students in San Quentin have had experiences with psychiatric evaluations, right? It's something they have to undergo often for a parole hearing. They had very strong experiences and really insightful things to say about what it's like to be sort of adversarially examined by a psychiatrist, right? It's something that most of us have never experienced or many, I certainly haven't. So yeah, that was the case they were arguing. Thank you so much for that. And I will now turn over to our next, uh, introduce our next speaker. And I'll just say to everybody, please do continue to add questions into the Q&A and we'll get to them as we go along at the end of the event. So it's now my pleasure to introduce Paula Arai, a professor of Buddhist studies at Louisiana State University, holding the Ermila Gopal Singhal Professorship in Re Religions of India. Professor Jody Green at our university was kind enough to introduce Dr. Arai to us, and we're thrilled that she's here today. Paula is the author of Women Living Zen, Japanese Buddhist Nuns, and um, Bringing Zen Home, The Healing Heart, I'm sorry, The Healing Heart of, Judas, of Japanese Buddhist Women's Rituals, and her most newest book, Painting Enlightenment, Healing Visions of the Heart Sutra, The Buddhist Art of Ozaki Sunio. I'm so grateful, Paula, for you to join us. I'm oh, there we go. Well, thank you so much for having me here. I'm delighted that you are still on Zoom because I can join here from Louisiana, um, very easy. And I'm um, excited to share this information particularly with such a wide range of people's backgrounds being represented here. Artists, contemplatives, and scientists are often the vanguard of civilizational development, serving as seers who envision a trajectory of growth, and innovators who develop new ways to respond to their unfolding understandings of reality. Iwasaki merges the streams of Buddhism, science, and art to harmonize resonances he discovered between scientific and Buddhist views of reality. He shaped the Chinese characters of the Heart Sutra into artistic imagery drawn from the ephemeral beauties of nature, Buddhist cultural life, and microscopic and telescopic wonders. Witnessing the horrors of war in the nuclear age and triumphs of technology in the 20th century, Iwasaki was driven to ameliorate the fragmented attention, environmental destruction, and personal and communal violence that threaten our survival. He found a way to express how scientific knowledge and Buddhist wisdom can enrich and expand one another 
with signs revealing the necessity and external means of intervention and Buddhist teachings offering an alternative to the greed, hatred and fear that spawn planetary misery. Iwasaki knew that imagery and signs are fundamentally reliant on sensory experience. But Buddhist teachings caution that the senses untrained in wisdom can misinform, leading to delusions that result in suffering. The untrained senses enable one to see what is conventionally real, but to see what is ultimately real requires refined mental acuity and profound understanding. Employing sacred words to form a vast range of images is the key to how his paintings guide the viewer to see wisdom encoded in the objects he portrays and by extension in all things. Iwasaki's choice of the Heart Sutra as the structuring element of his paintings indicates the philosophical underpinnings of his oeuvre. The scripture's central formulation is, form is emptiness, Emptiness is form. Emptiness is the concept that everything is interrelated and ever changing. So there are no independent entities. What we perceive as objects and persons are unboundaried flows of energy in perpetual interaction and flux. Nonetheless, our senses and mental processes shape reality into perceptible forms, such as dewdrops and stars. The Heart Sutra teaches the insubstantial nature of all we perceive and enjoins compassionate activity to relieve suffering. Iwasaki's paintings provide a visual expression of emptiness, which is the dynamic energetic matrix of reality that makes possible the arising of fleeting phenomenal forms. Forms depend on the potentiality of emptiness while emptiness is only discoverable through the presence of forms. For example, if you wanted to look closely at a form, perhaps a hard rock, and you get close enough to see the electrons that make up the rock, you would see it as porous and pulsating with activity. Forms are not solid entities at all. Yet, if you turn to see emptiness more closely and bump into the wall, you find out how hard emptiness can be. Just as we see the activity of gravity when we watch a flower pot fall, we see the activity of emptiness each time we see a flower or fish. Viewing Iwasaki's art in a larger cross-cultural and historical context illuminates its significance tracing how a ninth century Zen master's perception changed during the journey to enlightenment offers a helpful interpretive lens. Before embarking on the path to enlightenment, mountains are mountains. While studying emptiness and ultimate reality, mountains are not mountains. Experiencing enlightenment, mountains are mountains. Though my intention is not to rank art in order of enlightened awareness, pre-modern Western art captures moments of reality as we know it, offering an illustrious range of realistic images, portraiture, still lifes, landscapes. Representational art corresponds to the first, mountains are mountains, form is form. Abstract art illustrates the principle of mountains are not mountains. This is a more critical understanding of reality. Form is deconstructed and evokes how form is emptiness. It shows us reality is reimagined in response to scientific revelations that challenge common notions of reality from discovering atoms are not solid to detecting billions of galaxies in a rapidly expanding space-time continuum, the familiar everyday world seems less real and less significant. By infusing his paintings with the Heart Sutra teaching, 
Form is emptiness, emptiness is form. Iwasaki's images of precisely represented phenomena integrate scientific knowledge with Buddhist wisdom. Having fathomed that emptiness is form, Iwasaki reveals the enlightened view of mountains are mountains. Rather than leaving us estranged and dislocated, his paintings present a view of reality that is recognizable yet different. In the law of conservation of energy, Iwasaki saw a key to unlock our compassionate nature. Forms change, but vital energy is never lost. We are all changing patterns of the same energy. We are inextricably interrelated. Iwasaki's intricate renderings of familiar forms interlaced with the Heart Sutra illuminate our impermanent and cosmic context by revealing that the changing nature of forms is due to our interrelatedness. In the face of personal angst, social distrust, and global uncertainty, Iwasaki's paintings offer a vision of our wholeness and the necessity of compassion. He lures us by showing us the beauty of everyday forms. Iwasaki's painting of a strand of DNA evokes all life, for it is common to all living beings, from bacteria to blue whales. Whether one applies a Buddhist understanding of emptiness or scientific understanding of biological processes, DNA is not a concrete and independent entity or object. Rather, it is interconnected with every condition that affects its activity. Iwasaki merges the ecological vision of a thoroughly interrelated biosphere and Buddhist teaching of universal interrelatedness. Iwasaki's ethical orientation points beyond socially constructed distinctions that justify neglect, exploitation, and harm by drawing attention to what living beings share. Stars' nuclear reactions illuminate the night sky, enabling us to know where we are in space-time. A steady gaze reveals we are in perpetual motion and that we are not alone in the vast expanse. Viewing stars swirling in the sky above is also an enigmatic form of time travel. We can see millions of years into the past while standing still in the present moment, expanding notions of here and now. In Mandala of Evolution, Iwasaki focuses on the causes and conditions of dependent co-arising and the nature of emptiness. His inspiration came from the question, who are my ancestors? This mandala is his answer. He begins with himself or any viewer of the painting represented as a contemplative pilgrim. Each father is represented as a white Buddha and each mother as a red Buddha, asserting we are the progeny of Buddhas. The sum of parents continuing back for 30 generations reaches well more than a billion. Such a figure brings home the point that we are not just metaphorically one big family, we are biologically interrelated. Aware that light is energy, Iwasaki selects Amida Buddha for the center of his mandala of evolution because this Buddha is the Buddha of infinite light. This sublime and expansive genealogical tree spreads out to the perimeter of the circle in a continuous extension that includes asteroids striking the earth. Complex molecules taking shape Cells forming, amoeba, paramecium, seaweed, jellyfish and mollusks, fish and amphibians, dinosaurs, butterflies, primates, and cherry blossoms. Our sun swelling into a red giant 
and creating a planetary nebula, releasing hydrogen atoms that might generate new stars and galaxies in a constant flow of transformation. To further highlight the dynamic flow of energy, Iwasaki encircles the mandala with a golden adamantine dragon. Dragons are revered and respected as powerful protectors of the healing way of wisdom and compassion. Enlisting the Greek Uroboros symbol of infinity and perfection, the dragon swallows its own tail to illustrate the Heart Sutra teaching that there is no beginning or end no birth, no death. Transformation keeps happening, weaving us all together in a cosmic egg. Who are my ancestors? Descendant of lightning, hydrogen atoms from the dawn of the universe aerate my lungs. Iron traces of stellar explosions course through my veins. The regenerative power of starfish fuels my creativity. The adventurous courage of amphibians quickens my gait. Begat from paramecium and ginkgo trees, my great-great-grandfather, an amoeba, my grandmother, a cherry blossom. I will become rain. Hydrogen makes up 75% of the atoms in the universe and is pervasive on Earth, giving us water and life to all sentient beings. To convey the meaning of the Heart Sutra, however, Iwasaki chose Bohr's representation of the hydrogen isotope tritium to elicit the sutra's wisdom. He painted three Buddhas in the nucleus of this radioactive isotope, one in its proton and one in each of its two neutrons. Its electron is a Buddha swirling around rings of the Heart Sutra. The tritium atom powers suns and stars in a process of fusion whose cosmic rays interact with Earth's atmosphere, though leaves only traces. Iwasaki's choice to convey the Heart Sutra using this atom urges us to see the planet as part of a dynamic cosmos. Humans have harvested and manipulated this atom's potential in service, among other things, of constructing bombs. First came uranium, enabling President Truman to explain on August 6, 1945, it is an atomic bomb. It is a harnessing of the basic power of the universe. A plutonium bomb devastated Nagasaki three days later. Scientists would soon supersede these weapons of mass destruction by unlocking the power of fusion to create a hydrogen bomb with more than 500 times the power of those unleashed on Japan. As a survivor of World War II, Iwasaki manifests the expansive compassion of the Heart Sutra in his Buddha-filled hydrogen atom. Iwasaki's magnum opus, Big Bang, E equals MC squared, traverses six scrolls to span 17 feet as it offers an intimate view of an infinite vista. Big Bang theorists speculate that 13.82 billion years ago, a burst of expansion called inflation generated gravitational waves moving space time. We can see we are an integral part of this expanse. Our Milky Way soars across the scrolls with our nearest neighbor, the similarly spiraling Andromeda galaxy in the far right corner. Earth is often a spiraling arm of the galaxy in the lower left where a contemplative figure stands on a mountain range. Dragons stir up interstellar debris and dust rich with elements that in turn give birth to new stars. The mother dragon on the right is incubating a nebula with six star eggs and the dragon on the left a nebula with eight star eggs, making the universe an expansive womb where out of emptiness stars are born, die and reborn in an interdependent flux of cosmic energy. 
the third dragon whirls maternally around a supermassive black hole that spins near the center of our galaxy. At the point of singularity, black holes are intensely dense with matter, not holes at all. Iwasaki interprets black holes as purifying agents of the universe. Generating immense gravitational force, black holes are cauldrons of compassion that draw debris towards themselves. As matter approaches, it swirls into the accretion disk, disk where the churning heat dissolves delusion, purifies karma, and incinerates greed and hatred. Black holes transform matter into light that fuels jets of light radiating deep into the universe. That which falls beyond the event horizon of the black hole extinguishes the flame of suffering. In this way, black holes are the bodhisattvas of the universe. The contemplative figure reflects how we too can function like black holes. Powered by the wisdom of emptiness, we are capable of transforming suffering into compassion. We can burn off the causes of suffering and radiate rays of compassionate light. After completing this painting, Iwasaki reflected, the Big Bang gave rise to my being. For this, I simply bow to the universe. Iwasaki leads viewers to see the interdependence of the universe and experience their interrelatedness, thereby healing the delusion of separateness that causes so much loneliness and despair. As form is emptiness, emptiness is form. So too, energy is mass, mass is energy. There is birth and death, there is no birth and death. Delusional, our spinning galaxy is a wheel of suffering. With no fear, ignorance, attachment, or hate, our galaxy is a wheel of liberation, swirling with wisdom and compassion. Swallowing tail, the dragon whirls. Gazing, the figure contemplates, where am I? Home. Iwasaki's artwork is a beacon for the 21st century that makes ideas and feelings visible, stimulating awareness of vast and intricate connections through concrete particulars. His visual ministrations unblock mental dams and transform perception. He shows us that if you commit the fallacy of misplaced concreteness, you mentally take it out of sync with the interdependent flow of reality. This reification of form is a delusion that baits fear, attachments, and anger. With a compassionate aim of relieving suffering, Iwasaki's paintings offer a choice for wisdom in a multicultural, scientifically informed, image-driven world. His imagery points to the complementarity of the investigative traditions of science and Buddhism as they converge in a message of mutual responsibility and collaborative experiments to unlock the code to compassion. Interdependent from the subatomic level to the intergalactic, Iwasaki visually conveys an ethics of interbeing, directing our attention beyond egocentric ethnocentric and species centric moralities of right and wrong to an ethic based on interrelatedness and shared destiny. With our greed driven economy, strident politics, aching environment and war torn hearts and bodies. His vision encourages us to see ourselves as porous, dynamic, and interdependent to see the wisdom of compassion. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Just a second. So everybody please do put questions in the Q&A and we'll come back in. Lindsay. <laughs> so. Now, uh, certainly, 
uh, not la at least, though perhaps last, I'm happy to welcome Ruth Marie Clay, Professor of Astronomy and Astrophysics at UC Santa Cruz. Ruth studies the formation of planetary systems, including our solar system. Her theoretical work investigates the birth of planets and gas disks orbiting young stars, dynamic evolution of planetary orbits, and the evolution of atmospheres due to escape over cosmic time. Her goal is to determine the processes that shape the diversity of planetary systems. I met her in a wonderful campus astrobiology and ethics reading group, which you can see our connecting thread here, and I've been looking forward to hearing her talk. Ruth, if you'll join us now, it'd be fantastic. Thanks. I thank you so much, Rachel. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Yes, yeah, so I, um, as Rachel said, I'm a theoretical astrophysicist. I study the physics of how planetary systems form and evolve. Um, and in my group, we're working on um, understanding a number of aspects of that process. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about it today, but I wanna start by, um, by mentioning what Rachel said, which is that I'm really excited uh, that astrobiology, um, the, the search for life outside of our solar system has, um, is on the verge of becoming a real uh, observation-driven uh, scientific endeavor. We're going to see uh, the signatures of life, I'm sure, uh, on a planet around another star. I can't guarantee it, but I feel sure in my lifetime. What I'm not sure about is that we'll know that we saw it. So what I do um, in my work is to try to understand um, the breadth of planetary systems, the breadth of kinds of planets that can be found um, are orbiting other stars. If you look at a star, what kinds of planets does it make? Because um, I think, I suspect, and I think many people would agree uh, that life is going to look on other planets very different than it looks like here. So we know that we have many organisms on Earth, but as Paula just emphasized, if we look at the Earth um, as we are now, um, what we're seeing is one interconnected biosphere. So we really only have one example of what life is like. And history has told us that um, the universe tends to be much more creative than we are. We've gotten very good at studying really complicated systems and understanding how they work but we're less good at extrapolating that to other very complicated systems that might exist, but that we've never seen. So um, with that in mind, um, what, what I like to do uh, is to decenter, at least in my mind, the search for life from Earth, and you know, here looking at us uh, in North America on Earth, um, and try to think about it from a much more agnostic perspective. And uh, just for context, um, uh, the astronomical community is really putting a lot of effort into searching for life elsewhere. And um, in terms of building new telescopes, um, there's a big effort now that was promoted by the Decadal Survey recently uh, to put work into um, uh, an optical UV telescope that would have the capability of imaging a planet like Earth around a sun-like star. Um, it will take decades to develop, um, and I'm really excited about it. If we're going to be building a big telescope, we should look for places where we have a proof of concept where life might be. But as I said, I'm not sure that that's where life is going to in general be. And so I'm interested in taking maybe the longer term patient approach of trying to figure out what does not life look like so that we can then go find the weird things um, where life has developed. So, so that's sort of the context of, of the work uh, that I'm going to, to talk to you about today. And, um, and I have to say, I'm, I'm patient. I, I don't mind if this takes more than my lifetime for us to understand. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to be part of the effort. All right, so to talk about um, what we know so far about the structures of other planetary systems um, and, and what we're trying to figure out, uh, I just wanna take a few moments uh, to, to uh, remind you all about the structure of our planetary system and what kind of planets that we have. So we have this um, diagram here, all the distances from the sun at the center are to scale, but the sizes of the objects aren't because everything including the sun would be a tiny dot that you couldn't see on here if we put this to scale. Um, 
space is is emptiness, as we were just hearing. Uh, outer space is emptiness, just like atoms are emptiness. Um, so these would all be tiny specks. But um, we've made them big enough that we can see. So we have in the center, uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars orbiting the sun interior to the asteroid belt. These are our terrestrial planets. Um, Outside of that, we have Jupiter and Saturn, and then we have Uranus and Neptune. And on the far side, on the far outside um, of Neptune, we have the trans-Neptunian region, also called the Kuiper Belt. Uh, and Pluto is a part of the Kuiper Belt. We didn't lose a planet, we gained a belt, just like the biggest asteroid was demoted when the rest of the asteroid belt was discovered. Um, uh, Pluto is no longer considered one of the eight planets because it's part of really an amazing population that tells us all sorts of things about the history of our solar system that um, is a topic for another day. Um, okay, so this is what our system looks like. What are the planets? Here are um, pictures of a few of the planets to scale in terms of their, their sizes. We have Jupiter as a representation of a gas giant. Uh, Earth and Mars in the bottom right are terrestrial planets. Uh, Neptune in the top right is an ice giant. Sometimes it's uh, uh, lumped in with the gas giants, uh, Uranus and Neptune, but, um, but they are actually intermediate in size between um, Earth and Jupiter. Um, they're actually also intermediate in another way. If you look at the atmospheres on these planets, they're very different. Um, our terrestrial planets have very small fractions of, uh, of our mass in atmosphere. It's about a millionth here on Earth, so obviously the air that we breathe is very important, but it's not a very big fraction of Earth's mass. Um, if you look at Uranus and Neptune, they have atmospheres that's made of hydrogen and helium that are about 10% of their mass. And then if you move to the gas giants, um, uh, Jupiter and Saturn, they're majority gas. They do have solid cores in the middle, but um, more than 95% of Jupiter is, is made of gas. Okay, so these are, are very different structures. And in fact, um, in many ways, Jupiter is kind of like a star. Its moons, um, its Galilean satellites, are very similar to terrestrial planets. And if you put Ganymede next to Mars, they look very similar both in size and, and in their appearance. So these are very different kinds of objects um, in our system. Uh, so now if we, we put that back on the diagram here from an exoplanet perspective, and this, part, this is partly because I'm a theorist, but it's, but it's more than that is because this is what we can see um, around other stars. Our system has four Earths, two Jupiters, and two Neptunes in it. That's kind of what we can get at the moment by looking at other planetary systems. We can get a sense of how big the planets might be and what they might be made of sort of in a gross sense. All right, so this is our system. Um, how do we think it got here? Uh, this is a picture of the nearby Orion star forming region. Um, many massive stars are being formed in this, uh, this region. It's the closest one to get beautiful images like this of. And in those insets, what you can see are baby stars. Um, with structures of, of gas around them. Uh, what those are, are um, what's called accretion disks. They're material that's trying to fall onto the star and make the star grow, but it's getting stuck. And the reason that that happens is you have um, this giant cloud of gas uh, sitting here. It gets massive enough that its own gravity makes it start to collapse. But um, the gas cloud is much, much bigger than the final star that it's going to form. When it starts to collapse, it has just a little bit of rotation to it. There's always just a little bit of motion out there. It's imperceptible. But as it collapses further and further, because of angular momentum conservation, just like when a figure skater brings his arms in and starts spinning up faster and faster, um, that gas starts to spin more. And as you go around in a circle more, then um, you start getting pushed outward from the center of that motion. And um, you probably have experience with that from driving in a car, right? You take a sharp turn and you feel like you're getting pushed away from the center of that turn. Um, and the same thing happens here from the gas that's in the plane of that rotation gets pushed outward because of the rotation. Whereas gas that's on the top and the bottom, it just falls down and flattens. So it's just like a, a ball of pizza dough. You spin it, you throw it in the air and it flattens out. And um, this principle uh, generates disks all over the place in astrophysics. It's why our galaxy is a flat disk. You see disks around black holes. You see disks um, all sorts of places. So these are the young disks that are forming around stars. And thankfully for us, it actually is hard for those uh, disks to get rid of their angular momentum. So they stick around for a little while um, 
uh, and the early stages of star formation. And um, while they're sticking around, they form an environment in which planets can form. And this is a collection of really recent, beautiful images from, um, from ALMA, the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, which is located in Chile, um, showing uh, a collection of somewhat older disks than the ones that we just saw um, and that, that are around still relatively young stars. And you can see beautiful structures in these disks that might be um, indications that planets are forming and, and clearing out gaps um, in, in the disks. So we're seeing you know, the location of planet formation here. All right. So, um, so how do you, so when you're in this environment, then what happens to you? Um, well, what ends up, what we end up needing to, to have in order to make a planet in one of these disks around a young star is you need to form a seed. You need to form um, a solid seed to grow the planet because unlike that big gas cloud, um, for the most part, though there are possible exceptions and in the solar system and, and in most systems, there isn't enough gravity in that disk to actually allow planets to just collapse whole hog out of the disk. So, um, so what ends up happening instead is that um, you form solid material in the disk uh, that is going to um, coagulate into planets. And, and this diagram um, that I'm showing here is from recent work by, um, by an amazing graduate student who just graduated from my group named Diana Powell. Um, showing how uh, in different parts of the disk, you can actually make different compositions of solid material. So uh, it's not new the idea that very close to the star, you will have um, gas and rock in the disk and sort of the rock material is what you want to collect, coagulate into those planet seeds. It's hot there, you can't have ices. And in the outer part of the disk, you're, all, you're going to be able to also have ice to work with. Um, what Diana has done is shown that if you want to understand the formation of, of ice particles in the outer disk and how it uh, separates out from the gas into growing solid bodies made of ice, um, you can essentially use uh, the reverse of cloud physics that we've studied here on Earth and, um, and on other solar system planets. So this is a, a interdisciplinary uh, project um, that Diana worked with with both me and her other advisor, Shi Zheng, who is in, um, the Earth and Planetary Science Department, who does a lot of cloud work. Um, and it was really fun. Um, she showed that uh, essentially uh, the, the water, carbon, um, water, methane, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, ammonia, those sorts of things. Um, uh, let's think about water that uh, are in this outer part of the disk. The top part is heated by X-rays from the star, but it can mix down into the mid plane uh, get accumulated onto uh, a growing uh, large icy body, and then it can't get lofted back up to where it could be heated again. And so, you know, you have the cloud kind of in the middle, uh, the hot part on the top, and these solid bodies get big enough that they actually start drifting inward toward um, the star in the disk. And it actually decouples that icy material from the gas that it formed out of. And this is um, giving us uh, new and really exciting information about the building blocks that, that we have to form planets and what those planets are ultimately going to be made of uh, depending on the temperature structure in your disk. All right, so, um, so another thing that Diana has done, um, which is also really exciting, I'll just mention briefly, is take advantage of the fact that these disks actually look different at different wavelengths. And what we're looking at here are big particles we're talking about those, those things that were forming in the middle of the disk, big particles, smaller, smaller, smaller particles. And what we're seeing here is that the bigger particles actually drift toward the center of the disk. So it doesn't look as big, right? So that's this drifting process that we saw here, you know, going from one, two, three, four, um, where those ice particles can survive. This, even the solid, um, even just the rocky particles will also drift. Um, and we've developed a new way to weigh these disks using this particle drift and found that many of the disks are actually substantially more massive than, um, than was expected. Uh, and one of the really hard things in, in figuring out um, what kinds of planetary systems are going to form is actually figuring out what you start with. Um, and so this, that's why this kind of work is really exciting to me. It's giving us um, new information about, about the, the starting conditions for forming planets. 
Okay, so to come back to these um, principles that we were talking about, why, why might you form a, a system like the solar system? Um, this is the idea that we had sort of the summary before discovering extrasolar planets, the so planets around other stars or exoplanets. Um, and the idea is sort of in the middle of the disk, it's hot, so you don't have ice, you just have rock to work with. Um, the circle here in the middle is not so big, so there's just not a lot of stuff. You form puny planets like Earth. Then as you go farther out in the disk, um, it's sort of shaded in here um, to show that, uh, that now ices can form because it's cold enough. Also, just this circle is bigger. There's just more stuff out here. So as those things collide and grow and coagulate together, there's just more material to work with. So you can make bigger solid bodies. If you make something really big, then suddenly its gravity becomes very important and it starts sucking in all of the hydrogen and helium gas in its neighborhood. If you imagine um, something like 10 times the mass of the earth and it sucks in another 10 times the mass of the earth in hydrogen and helium, now you have a 20 earth mass thing and now it can suck in you know, 20 more earth masses of hydrogen and helium and that whole process runs away until you end up with a huge amount of gas. And that's how we think uh, that the gas giants, um, Jupiter and Saturn formed. Now, uh, the question is, okay, but what about the ice giants in the outer disk? Um, as you go out farther from the star, it takes longer to orbit around the sun. That also means it takes longer for things to collide and grow. So these actually do have very massive icy you know, cores to them that could in principle have accreted a massive hydrogen helium envelope like Jupiter and Saturn. But the, the, the thought, the leading thought is that they didn't have time. Um, this disk around young stars only lasts for a few million years. And so if you don't grow big enough to, to grab the gas um, in that amount of time, uh, then you miss out. So this is the idea, it worked incredibly well for the solar system. It looks like you know every system should look this way, but as I said before, the universe is always more creative than we are. And so um, extrasolar planets that have been discovered in the last now almost three decades, um, since the first one was discovered, have you know really thrown a wrench into, um, into the idea that all systems would look similar to ours. So uh, I'm gonna show a couple of plots, but I'm gonna be sure to say out loud what, I'm, what I hope you'll get away from them. Uh, the first uh, plot here is uh, just a dot for every extrasolar planet that has so far been discovered. Left to right means farther from the star. That's orbital period, but orbital periods are longer if you're farther from the star. Bottom to top means on the left hand more massive or on the right hand, you're larger. So these aren't all the same dots because for some planets, we only know the mass or we know the radius. We don't know both. Um, and one of the key things that I want you to take away from this is that we found tons of planets, but, um, but it's actually difficult to interpret the patterns that you see in these plots because a lot of the planets that are likely out there, we still can't see. So notice where Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, Earth, all of the solar system planets are not sitting in the regions where we found planets. And that's not necessarily because solar systems are really weird. Um, it could well be just that we can't see those, well, it is that we can't see those systems very well yet. So we're looking at you know, the tail of the elephant and the trunk of the elephant, and we're trying to figure out you know, how does this all fit together? And um, I just wanna highlight a couple of big surprises that came out of this. First of all, if you look on the bottom right here, you'll see that there are a ton of planets with sizes in between Earth and Neptune, they're just like, we don't even have all the kinds of planets in our solar system. A third of stars have planets um, like that, that we don't even have an analog of in our solar system. Um, if we look at the gas giants, I want you to notice, uh, just look at the top left here. Most of the gas giants that have been found, there are these massive planets, have orbits interior to that of Jupiter. And they're also, they, some of them are really massive. Wait a minute, didn't I just say you had to be outside uh, an outer part of the, the solar system to make a gas giant? Well, all the ones that have been found are in the inside. So who ordered that? Some of them are like even on like four day orbits, so close to their star that they're only, they're like a 120th the Earth's sun distance, sitting just about 10, Earth ra 10 stellar radii away from their star. Nobody ordered this, very, um, uh, very unexpected. 
So we know that the solar system is not typical. We don't know if it's rare yet because we can't see solar systems very well, but we know that it's not typical and that there are all sorts of other things going on. And a unified model for understanding all of this hasn't been de developed yet. And um, so uh, I am going to uh, just tell you in my last uh, little bit of time, a story about one aspect of this that's related to recent work by, by another student in my group, Renata Froelich. And, um, and because I think it, it makes some, some interesting points. Okay, so this is a plot that shows, this is from um, uh, 2005. On the bottom here, it has this weird notation. This is iron divided by hydrogen. Uh, this is called metallicity. Astronomers call everything heavier than hydrogen a metal. So basically this is just a measure of on the right, you have more solid material. And on the left, you're more just hydrogen and helium. Um, and then up here was the percent of stars with planets uh, that were discovered. Um, and this, again, this is from 2005. Okay. So you look at this plot, it seems very convincing. If you have a star that has more metallicity, more solid stuff, then you have more planets. That seems like it makes kind of makes sense. Um, but since then, uh, we have discovered uh, more planets and it's become clear that that, at least in my view, is really not the right interpretation at all. So, um, so let's look, now this is again, distance from the star mass so this is very it uh, looks a little different but it's very similar to the, the other plot we were showing this is low metallicity stars this is high metallicity stars okay so i would argue that when you compare these two we're not seeing more planets around high metallicity stars we're seeing different planets around high metallicity stars you know out over here on the right they actually have pretty similar populations, you know, out in that region where we might have thought giant planets formed. But in, in um, the uh, close to the star, where they're easier to find, um, there are more around high metallicity stars. Okay, so it's not that high metallicity stars have more planets. In fact, we now know that basically every star in the sky has planets. It's that they have different kinds of planets. They have Jupiter kinds of planets in the inner regions uh, close to the stars. Okay. So, um, and I also just wanna point out that these, these planets are often much more massive than Jupiter. Okay, the other thing about these planets, while well, we look at this uh, video, is that they, um, they also have orbits that tend to not be very circular. Why is this not playing? Oh, there it goes. Okay, they have orbits that aren't very circular. Uh, our solar system's planets are on, elliptical orbits. They're not exactly circle, circles, but they're pretty close to circles. But these giant planets that we know of in their inner solar systems tend to be very non-circular. And uh, this uh, animation gives you a sense of how you can get a non-circular orbit. Those two planets had a, a major interaction with each other. One of them was kicked out of the system entirely, and you ended up with somebody on an elliptical orbit. So interactions between planets make them non-circular. But if you do that in the inner system, you end up uh, not with kicking uh, the planets out, but with collisions. And this is how we think the moon formed. Uh, a collision between two planets formed the Earth-Moon system. Um, and what Renata has worked on is whether giant impacts can actually lead to collisions and collisional growth for gas giants in their inner systems. One of the clues that we're trying to explain here is that high eccentricity gas giants that are more non-circular actually have higher mass, which is weird because it takes more to kick a more massive planet onto a more non-circular orbit. And because I'm running out of time, I'm, I'm not gonna go through this, but, uh, but you also see a metallicity signature in these planets. So what Renata did is develop a model where disks where you start with more planets in the inner system collide, grow to more massive gas giants, and they actually end up with all, through all those interactions having a higher eccentricities. And um, the results with very little fine tuning, which is always a problem with models, like basically no fine tuning, match uh, very well with the observations. So, um, and they match on, in this as well. So, uh, so perhaps these planets that we're seeing are actually not at all typical 
of planetary systems. These are the weird ones where you had a lot of gas giants um, in them. They ended up colliding and growing and having a giant dynamical upheaval. Um, and so what we're seeing is like the tail of that elephant. And my last point that I wanna make here is that eccentric gas giants, the ones that we're talking about, they're awesome, but they're not good for Earth-like neighbors. What is this plot? To the right is distance from the sun. Up and down is how circular you are. If you're on the bottom at zero, you're circular. Up at the top, you're extremely non-circular. Our gas giants are down here at the bottom, they're circles. These dots are extrasolar planets. Okay, if you put a gas giant like that at Earth's orbital distance, um, it's gonna be uh, clearing out any terrestrial planets in its region. You're not gonna have an Earth orbiting there. Even if you put an Earth-like moon around that planet, it's gonna be not so great for finding, um, for developing at least Earth-like life because it's on this really eccentric orbit. It'll get really close to the sun and really far away and it's gonna have really extreme temperature variations. So though initially, um, the initial result was that high eccentricity stars host the most planets, um, it's not at all clear that they're the ones that are likely to host planetary systems like ours. So this comes back to um, where I started. Um, I, I'm really interested in trying to figure out what determines if you have a given star, what kind of planetary system you make. And I wanna know how we can figure out what non-life does in all of those circumstances so that when we see those strange places that, that host completely unexpected things, we'll actually be able to recognize them as what they are. So thank you. Thank you so much for that. Everyone can turn their cameras on. I have to say those were fascinating and fascinating right next to each other. And Ruth, I have to say, so in this kind of the eccentric examples, I was like, oh, I'm gonna come up with a question that I can ask all of you. And then I was like, no, no, I'm really not. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't think it's so close. I think if I had like 15 minutes, I could probably do it and sit here with my computer. But, um, but one of the things I was thinking was, I was wondering if you're thinking that there's kind of eccentric examples that could not possibly produce life like there is on earth. If you're still want, saying that perhaps they could produce life outside of what we would expect or know. Absolutely. We have no idea what kind of life is out there, but it wouldn't be like what we, we have here. So, um, so we'd have to be looking for something, something different. So I think that, uh, I think that my perspective is I'm completely agnostic as to what kinds of complicated uh, life systems are, are, are out there because I just think the universe is more creative than we are, as I said. Um, and if we're gonna find them, we really have to understand all of the funky physics that's going on in these weird planetary systems that aren't like ours so that we can recognize differences from that. You know, maybe, maybe the life like lives on, maybe it just can handle huge uh, temperature variations. There are life forms on Earth that can do that. It seems like, I mean, there's something to talk about, about ethics across all of these, the ethics of knowledge and ethics of trying to understand interconnected systems, the ethics of trying to to figure out how belief plays into this and where belief acts as blinders that I also think is a really interesting that I cannot make a question out of, <laughs> you know, but that I think is a really interesting through fair that I wish there was a way that we could just figure out how to talk about. That there were some words that, sorry to interrupt you, there were some words uh, Paula said related to that that I can't bring back to mind, but maybe you can, Paula, about um, like the, the, yeah, about blinders based on reality that is is conventional, conventional reality. Yeah, I love that. We have conventional yeah. reality, but we want to know true reality. Yeah, all what well, you say, ultimate reality, and that's all a theory. It's not like there are these realities, um, but lenses um, and where our consciousness goes, we will perceive it in a certain way. And so what you were just saying about, you know, we don't know what these life forms are like, it made me think, um, you know, the Buddhist tradition is always trying to dissolve dualisms that the subject object and this and that and me and you as if we're separate, they're trying to say no, no, it's not quite like conventionally it appears like we're different, but we are all affecting each other. And so I was thinking uh, the uh, Zen master that I specialize in Dogen 13th century, he um, 
comes up with, you know, like rocks and rags and trees, they're all Buddha nature. And he dissolves the distinction between sentient and non-sentient beings. And so if, you know, you're an astrobiologist looking for different forms of life, I thought, um, and this is related to someone's question, that that may help inform you to be open to what looks like you know, inert matter or non-sentient entity or thing out there that maybe it does have, maybe to use a word that I don't know if astrobiologists would use, but, you know, consciousness um, that we just don't know how to, uh, we don't have the consciousness to be able to comprehend that kind of consciousness. So that was, sorry, I'll say one more quick thing. So then the ethical, um, imperative is kindness um, because you know it, it's all maybe alive. And I think that there seems to be like an openness to to not thinking through your own organizing principle as the only way in which to think or to approach materials. Which I thought that's why it was such an interesting because I think all of you are um, tr are thinking about this is how to be open to forms of knowledge and thinking that might not be the lens through which everybody is looking, right? That Kyle, you do this. And I just have to say that there's multiple questions about other topics that come up in um, the public philosophy formats. And Raoul Birnbaum actually asked about how this works with children. Like what are the topics? You've given us an example from, and I'll, I'm gonna work in some of the questions from the audience. So <laughs> as is my job, but um, you know, how does this work within children and their kind of, what are the subjects they give and the kind of arguments they make, if you've given us the other example? Sure, yeah. Um, so the, 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 like the goal with the kids, um, what the University of Hawaii calls plain vanilla, which is like whatever questions they come in with, right? Like we'll have a process, um, often involves silence, like thinking time is part of it, right? Teaching them that like being quiet and contemplating can be part of class also. And they all write questions and they vote. And so like when they've learned how to do it, it's really anything they bring in. But that takes a while. So what we tend to do is bring in prompts. So like bring in things that will make them or induce them hopefully to think about philosophical questions. So like, um, I like bringing in different types of illusions are often great, right? Getting them thinking about like, what is perception? How do we know something? There's a whole bunch of great taste illusions you can bring in uh, that get kids going. Um, to give a concrete example, so like justice and fairness is something they often wonder about. And so, you know, we can play a game where we bring in like around Halloween, maybe a bag of candy and just chuck it on the floor and it's all different types and all different amounts and talk to them. What, what would it mean to fairly or ethically divide this among the group? I did that with a class. And then in a future week, um, they ended up wanting to talk about justice and fairness with individualized education programs. So they were like wondering in their class, they're like, look, I can like, we're all doing the same work and that there's somebody helping them. <laughs> like, why aren't they helping me? Like these questions were arising out of their everyday life and they were really wondering, like they wanted to talk about and they weren't like against it. They wanted to understand what did it mean? Like, so equality wasn't just equal treatment. There was something about people needing different amounts of stuff. So those, those are the kinds of things. Um, those are some examples. That's great. I also want to say that I said organizing principle because Jay Gurish put it in the comments in the question section too. I realized that I took his and <laughs> claimed it a little bit as my own in my last thing. And I should have, I should have, I, acknowledge that I was kind of bastardizing his question. Um, but let's see, what else do we have? And if you have questions for each other too, please do join in. And actually Matthew, uh, Matthew Shetron has a question for Ruth and Kyle, which is, do you think that modern scientific method is more like the, uh, the ethical debating or the forensic debating, the classical legalistic debate that you mentioned earlier? That's a good one. That's really, I'm, I'm much more curious to hear what the scientist thinks about the scientific method. But like, I often think that like the ethics bowl is more like us trying to solve a problem. It's more like legislative or democratic deliberation than legal. I'm also a former litigator, like I used to be a lawyer and I have strong feelings about that form of debate as being non-productive. Um, so I hope scientific practice is more <laughs> open and constructive and less combative, but. Yeah, I mean, I think that it, uh, as in, in any endeavor, people can be competitive with each other. But uh, but I do think that it, uh, at least to me, it seems much more like the ethics bull um, process because uh, 
you know, you can, you can argue against someone else's idea, but if you don't present their idea in the most effective and, um, you know, understanding light, then no one's going to be convinced by your argument. And fundamentally, everybody in the room is trying to get to the best understanding of what's going on. So there's a, um, you know, depending on the personalities involved, there can be an adversarial aspect, but I think overall it is much more of a, a collaborative uh, endeavor where those adversarial parts are there to try to present all of the different arguments in their best light and then come to what is, uh, what works best. Yeah, I think it's important to note, like ethics bowl, there can be really profound disagreements, right? Sometimes the teams really disagree with each other and that's fine, right? Um, because they actually disagree about the underlying ethical issues. So Paula, can I ask you the really um, kind of logistical or the practical question that's in all of this, which is what sect of Buddhism does Iwazaki adhere to? Which sect of Buddhism does Iwazaki adhere? Yeah, so um, like most Japanese, uh, his family was in one sect and there's historical political reasons why that happened. Um, and that's the Pure Land sect. So Amida Buddha is, you know, figures centrally in the Pure Land sect. Um, but he personally studied um, Zen Buddhism for decades. And he found that as he was asking questions and also ethical questions, that those were central to his mind about what he had done himself as a research scientist and what he knew about the scientific world, he found uh, the conversation with Zen teachings was a, a little more um, amenable to conversation, um, I guess I want to say. And he, though, um, he worked on viruses and uh, uh, worked with uh, silkworms. And um, he admitted at after he retired, you know, killing a bunch of silkworms all day long, trying to work with, learn about the viruses, you know, all with his noble intent. And it wasn't until he retired that he realized, what have I done? I never like prayed for them. I never thanked them. I just treated them, you know, as my tools. And he had tremendous remorse when he realized he had done that. And like, you know, his left hand didn't know what the right hand was doing. And so he did do a painting. I can't bring it up real quick right now, but where he uh, had to forgive himself. And he paints himself um, in hell, um, lifting beings up to this rainbow um, to help them get out of the hell that he had conscripted them in. And so um, he, you know, the, the scientific world that he was trained in did not ask him to think about the silkworms as beings to have, you know, more responsibility for. Um, but when he had gotten deeper into the Buddhist teachings then he realized, you know, this makes no sense. Of course, they're beings to be respected. Um, should I give another one? So Kyle, there's another one for you about the use of the words hermeneutic and epistemic to talk about uh, exclusion, right? And asking, you know, if this is basically social exclusion and which inevitably includes knowledge and interpretation and social credibility. So does it help the goal of public philosophy to use the language of the epistemic and the hermeneutic? This feels like two questions. The last one is very practical and I'm like, I don't know, <laughs> like it might not, right, to use this lingo. Um, I think, so I could be wrong about this. In my experience, like it's not just social ex exclusion and, and social inclusion doesn't fix the problem. Um, so like San Quentin is tremendously programmed. There's like, I think up close to a hundred kinds of programs and a huge amount of what happens there, the programming is somebody coming in to deliver some lecture or some method or some technique to improve the lives of the incarcerated men to like teach them how to be better, right? Like coming in as an expert or, you know, I might derogatorily call it like a savior complex. Like, okay, I'm like a regular functioning adult. I'm going to go help these people get better, right? And, and learn how to get out. It's very condescending. Um, and it's, 
it's actually, I don't think it involves epistemic inclusion. It's not taking them as agents capable of participating in knowledge construction. It's treating them as dysfunctional or broken agents and trying to fix them, right? So I actually think epistemic inclusion is not being, like is a separate thing and social inclusion doesn't always fix it. Social inclusion can even be alienating if you're forcing someone to come in only under your terms, right? Only with your terminology. But all of that being said, the terms epistemic, epistemic and particularly hermeneutical, yeah, I don't, I don't know if those um, help make sense of it or not. It's probably why I like the everyday examples, right? Like To Kill a Mockingbird, I think is something that has a concrete force, whether you like the word epistemic or not. I think that one of the things that I kept thinking, Paula, actually, as you were doing your presentation and you were showing the images and kind of across the three for three images, the images that kept repeating in my head were the people that were wearing the word prisoner on themselves, like, you know, all of those people in the uniform are being marked in a very certain way that then your work is trying to, you know, about seeing something other than that word, right? Just as um, I think that Paula, it, well, I think all of you are doing beautifully this, like what else is there to see or to perceive beyond what the kind of, what we're just being told at the surface. And I do think this kind of continuing back to Jay's question about this, like trying to find coherence or the central principle is something that I would love to, or organizing principle is his word, something I'd love to hear you talk about more, Ruth, because I did wonder, I had a kind of half question jotted down about whether if our solar system seems like an anomaly, if the gas giants seem like an anomaly, are you, it's, what are we really finding is anomaly or the eccentric after the eccentric, right? Is there, do you think that you're leading towards an organizing principle? Well, I think we are leading towards an organizing principle. And the problem uh, right now uh, is, as I said, we're sort of looking at the different parts of the elephant. We've, you know, we've got the trunk and we've got the tail, but we don't have the middle part. And, um, and I think that, uh, you know, as, as observational capabilities advance, we'll be able to see more of that middle part, but I also think that there's a lot of theoretical um, advance that we can make even with the data that we have. So, uh, so my personal thought is that those gas giants that are really eccentric, I mean, they're eccentric because they interacted with each other. Those are the systems that happened to, for whatever reason, and we wanna understand what the reason is, make a lot of gas giants in them. And so they're the really massive ones. And if you, and so you end up with, you know, this excitation, these collisions, growth to being really big, and that makes you really easily seen. Um, so it's the tail that can be easily seen. Um, those super earths are the ones are, are only visible if they're really close to their stars, because we have to see them as they pass in front of their stars. And if they're far away, it's really unlikely for them to pass in front of their stars. So we're just seeing a population that's in the interior of the system. So about 30% of systems have those super earths that have no analog in the solar system, 30% of stars. So it's not a few, mm -hmm. that's a lot, but there's still another 70%, you know, that don't. Um, the gas giants, you know, that's depending on, you know, how much that you're, uh, you're of the system you're looking at, that's from like, you know, one to 15% of the systems have, you know, those kinds of gas giants in them. Um, so there's still a whole lot of space for systems like ours. And I think it's really an open question if, if our system is unusual. Um, we really don't know yet, which I think is really exciting. I love being in this field where we keep getting new data and we don't know fundamentally what's going on. I wanna know what that organizing principle is and we, we haven't figured it out yet. That's what I'm excited about. That's great. Well, we're actually out of time tonight, but this was great. And I do wish, I wish we were all in one place because I think that, the, you know, it's such a lively and such an interesting conversation to think across these really vastly different research areas and to think about how it generates. But thank you all so much for this. It was delightful. Yes, <laughs> it was. Thank you. Thank and thanks you. everyone for joining us today. <laughs>